Good evening and welcome to Bethany Baptist Church. This is our virtual online midweek connection point. It is October the 7th. Thank you for joining us. If you did not get to gather with us in person last Sunday, it was a sweet, sweet time of singing, praying, reading through scripture and applying God's word real practically to our times of suffering that all Christians are called to endure in different degrees uh, in this world. So I encourage you to go back and watch that if you didn't get to online. Uh, also remind you that we've restarted all of our Sunday school classes with proper social distancing and being careful. Um, that's at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday. So all of our classes but one, and that other one will be uh, resuming in another week or so. So come join us in God's Word in a more intimate setting uh, where we can dialogue and get to know each other um, better. Also, this coming Sunday morning in our 10.30 worship, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper um, as a church family. So come with your hearts prepared to focus on Christ. Be uh, ask the Lord to reveal any unrepentant sin and then be repenting if He reveals that to you uh, right away. And um, any breach of fellowship, seek and reconciliation as far as it is possible for those who are willing to talk through and work through disagreements. And then we'll be renewing our church covenant, Lord willing, together responsibilities to one another who are um, claiming the name of Christ and awaiting His return. Um, so this evening, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And we're just going to do the first 23 verses, and you'll be thankful because the whole chapter is 52 verses. So we'll break that up into two weeks. Uh, we'll do a full devotion tonight from verses 1 through 23. Uh, for those of you who will be gathering or who missed the gathering tonight in person at church at 7 p.m., uh, we're not having a business meeting um, because our secretary is out. And she's very important um, helper during our time of business, and there's not any pertinent information or things need to happen this month. So we're just going to forego that until next month, the first Wednesday of next month. Um, so continue with us in 1 Samuel chapter 14, or read verses 1 through 23. Here is how it reads. One day, Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migran. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other Senna. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of that garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us, we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within, as it were, a half a furrow's length and an acre of land. And there was panic in the camp and the field and among all the people, the garrison, even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Verse 16, And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priest, the someone in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed after him in the battle. So the Lord saved, the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond Beth. 
Aben. Very rich text. I have really enjoyed this, especially for a Wednesday night Bible study as I studied yesterday and this morning. I really like this, as you'll see, because I've got several, I hope, encouraging and applicable points to you. So we're going to do four points of contrast. So then each of those will be one and then the other. So four points of contrast in this character development, uh, specifically in seeing what God has uh, revealed to us. So remind you what's going on in 1 Samuel. Uh, wicked King Saul of God's people has just basically been rejected by God for trying to manipulate God instead of waiting for God and trusting in him. And through Samuel, the good prophet, he has told him that in rejecting him, he will raise up one after him, a king after his own heart. So the Philistines are pressing upon Israel, upon God's people, even though they have a wicked king. Uh, and, and they're in a scary position. They're outnumbered. And so at any point, they could completely be destroyed by the Philistines. And God so moves in Jonathan, Saul's own son, to raise up and save his people um, as he trusts in the Lord. So here's the four points of contrast. The thing I want you to see first um, has to do with uh, Jonathan and, and Jesus and that this, that God is going to raise up a son, not after Saul's heart, but a son after God the Father's heart. I see this in verse 1. We're waiting for a new king or one after God's own heart to come to deliver God's people because Saul has failed. And we immediately see in verse 1 of 14 a new character. Jonathan is actually Saul's son. It says, One day Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So this is a good rebellion against his father. Uh, he's not telling his father because he knows his father would stop him from trusting in the Lord. He knows that his father would not do it in the Lord's way to seek deliverance for God's people. So this is good news. This is a sign of hope that even though Saul has been a, a wicked leader and is probably a wicked father, yet God in his kindness has raised up a son, Jonathan, who's not like his father, Saul, but after God's own heart. It's a beautiful thing. So I want to apply this to you out there. If you are a, a son or a daughter of ungodly parents, I don't want you to use as an excuse to not seek God or to trust in Him. God raised up Jonathan despite ungodly father in Saul. So rise above your parents and your upbringing. Seek God more diligently. Maybe your parents never took you to church, never set a godly example, never let the Word of God determine their way of life. Let God raise you up to follow His own heart and maybe not even the hearts of your own parents. Second thing is this, is some of you have godly parents. You have fairly godly or very greatly godly parents. They're not like Saul. Uh, they're actually trusting in the Lord. I want you to see also from this that you don't just have to settle for the amount of godliness and zeal that your parents have. Maybe they were Christians, but maybe nominal at best. You can rise above that. You can seek more victories in the Lord. Be more bold evangelists. Have more zeal for the Lord even uh, than your parents. Don't just settle. I, I think about this with Luke and Claire and Josiah and Asher and, and, a, and a fifth on the way. I don't just want them to be Christians. Although I really want that someday. I don't just want them to love God like their parents. I want them to exceed, exceed the trust that Meredith and I have for the Lord, that they would grow beyond that. And so we're raising the bar above our parents to trust and to know the Lord. And then a quick word to parents. Maybe you feel like a parent who's parented more like Saul. You've been an ungodly parent or lukewarm parent at best. There is still hope. Pray, confess your sins to your children, confess your sins to God. God is able still to redeem and raise up a Jonathan, even from a seed like Saul. So that's good news. Now that's verse one. I want to flip to the end of our text in verse 23 and contrast this and, and just go ahead and talk about Jesus right off the bat instead of at the end of our sermon. Verse 23 says, so the Lord saved Israel that day. The Lord, this is not just about being a better a child than our parents, or being a mighty warrior like Jonathan. This text is about God providing salvation for his people. God himself. The name Jesus means God, or Yahweh is salvation. So when Jesus comes to earth, he's not just like David or just like Jonathan. He is God in the flesh, redeeming his 
own people from their sin, delivering us from our shame, delivering us from the wrath of God. This is a foreshadowing when Jesus would come, God himself in the flesh, God's own son. We see Jesus' heart after the Father, trusting in the Father, though his companions abandon him, though the the battle seem impossible. He lays down his own life to rescue us from our sin. This is a foreshadowing of salvation in Jesus. So I want our text to not just be about being like Jonathan, but seeing how he foreshadows Christ. That salvation is of the Lord. So that was the contrast. God raised up a son not after Saul's heart, and God's own son will deliver us because he has a heart after the heavenly Father. So our second uh, points of contrast, I want you to see that God despises the counsel of the ungodly and God blesses the counsel of the godly. We have this contrast between who Saul is seeking counsel in and who Jonathan is seeking counsel in. That is the kind of people you and I assemble around us, the kind of people we get to support us or to correct us uh, or to share community with. Uh, I want you to see that God is showing that Saul has wicked counselors. It says in verse 2 that Saul was staying at the outskirts of Gibeah, so he's hiding in the caves. And look at the kind of people he has around him. There's a bunch of them. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, uh, the son of Ahadab, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. So we see that Saul has lots of friends. He has lots of companions. And they're even religious. But the astute reader will remember and notice who's not there in his council. Which godly person is not there in his counsel? Samuel. This shows us that Saul has not repented and sought godly counsel when Samuel was telling him that he was in sin. He's okay without having Samuel. And he's assembled people who are religious but are not seeking uh, to trust in God and do it God's way. Also, it mentions a, a, a man, Ahijah, who's of the lineage of Eli and Ichabod. Well, if you remember 1 Samuel, I think it is chapter 2, God had cursed this line of the priesthood because they were those who did the rituals um, in the temple, but their heart was far from God, and God had cursed their lineage. In fact, Ichabod means the glory of God has departed. This would be a hint as a Bible reader in your own devotion that these are bad counselors. These are bad counselors. Who are your counselors? Who is helping you determine God's will in your life right now? Are they lukewarm Christians at best? Are they your co-workers? Well, they're really nice and they make you feel good, but they're not speaking the truth. I imagine that Saul really liked having a Ahijah and all these around him because they would never tell him that he was wrong, that the person maybe he was dating was not God's will for him or her or that the things that they were speaking and the way that they were pursuing the things that they wanted were not God's will. Are you assembling people who will correct you and speak God's truth? Not just that they're religious or they do the rituals, but that they truly know God. I'm convinced that these people, they did not know God, and these were Saul's ungodly counsels. Well, contrast that. Again, there's our second point of contrast. Look at Jonathan's counselor, human counsel. There's not many who assemble with him, but this is a godly friend. Look at verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can do the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, so this is his counselor, do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. This is a godly friend. So Saul has at least 600 ungodly religious friends And Jonathan has a truly godly friend. We know this because this friend is willing to go against the rest of the ungodly people and sneak out and pursue the will of God, even if no one else will. We know this is a godly counselor because he hears Jonathan say that he's trusting in the Lord, not in numbers, not in his own might, but the Lord will give deliverance despite being many or few. And he says, yes, I'm with you. All that you say, I will do. I hope you have those kind of Christian friends. Those kind of godly counselors who encourage you to do the Lord's will. What does the Lord say in his word? Trust in him. Not on your own understanding or or bad counselors. Him. These kind of friends are rare and they are few. But they are out there. If you seek for them, wait for them and ask for them to encourage you to do God's thing. Even if you're uh, alone. Even if that means leaving your father and mother and their ungodly counsel. God will provide these kind of godly counselors 
to you. Now, I, I do think this armor bearer, if Jonathan is like a Christ figure in that he's trusting in the Lord and standing up like David to the Philistines or to Goliath, we ought to be like the armor bearer in, in this sense too, that that we're trusting in Jesus, that our hope is in him, that we say, Lord Jesus, who gives deliverance from my sin, from the wrath of God, whatever you say, I'll do. I'll follow you, whatever, uh, whatever you say you are. Lord, my heart and my soul are in unison with you. So we learn something about following Christ in the new covenant, following um, God in his uh, word, and, and God's going to bless this godly counsel. The third point Uh, In these last five minutes, the third point of contrast is this, that God is glorified by those who trust in him. God is not glorified by those who just trust in ritual. So this was happening in in some of the verses I just read. Notice what Jonathan's trust is in. Picking up the second sentence of verse 6 and saying we're going to go fight, he say, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by Few. Verse 9, he says, If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. So it's evident throughout Jonathan's battle tactics that he is trusting in the Lord. The Lord is salvation. He is the one who will deliver us from our enemies. He is the one who will cause temptation to flee. He is the one who will grant that my children will trust in me, uh, that they will give me their heart, that my enemies will be confounding. He's trusting in God, not in his own manipulation, not in his own rituals, not in his own strength or in his own numbers. Um, I hope it's the same with you, that your first reaction when temptation trial comes is to go to the Lord Uh, to go to him in prayer. Oh God, give me victory over the enemies. I wait upon you. I trust your word. Uh, I I cling to Christ. I I come to you. I hope hope that's the same way with you. If not, I hope you begin to do that now and being persuaded that the victory and the salvation is in those uh, or those who have who trust in the Lord. So he, he basically says, these Philistines, they've outnumbered us. If God is willing to give us a uh, victory about it, I'm willing to go to them and just say, hey, we're coming to you. I'm not even going to try to surprise attack them. I'm not going to try to gather a bunch of people. But if God is willing to give the, us victory over them, then they'll be confounded. So S- Jonathan and his armor, just two of them, they crawl on their hands and knees in a very vulnerable position and, and say, hey, we're coming to you. And they say, ha ha, come on, you little, you little Jews, you little Israelites. And he hears this sign that what he had asked of God, God has given to him. And they go and they kill them. Two guys, vulnerable, crawling up these rocky crags, are going to destroy two prepared and sh- or twenty prepared and strong Philistines. So, God is glorified by those who trust in Him, not in their own might, not in their own timing, not in their own will, but in God's um, power and might. So let's contrast that. This is a little more difficult, and I'm a little torn on how to interpret this. But contrast that with Saul's trusting not in. God directly, but in just rituals, religious rituals. Look at verse 16. So after God starts to grant the victory to Jonathan, his armor bearer, Saul realizes what's going on. Verse 16, the watchman of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. It's like, wait a second, we're winning. How, how are we winning all of a sudden? And then Saul said to the people who are with him, count and see who has gone from us. They're like, why in the world are we winning? Where is everybody? How, who, who escaped to go help start the battle? It's working. I don't know who it is. It's really interesting here that Saul doesn't even know where his own son is. <clears throat> now, we know it's because his son snuck out uh, and had holy rebellion against his wicked father. Um, but it's interesting that Saul is aware of where his ungodly counselors are, but he doesn't know where the godly person is who's left him or departed from him. I think it's just showing Saul's wickedness, his mispriorities uh, of loving ungodly people, loving more than loving God's people and and even loving God. I think it, there's a hint of that here. So he's like, what, what's going on? Who started this? Verse 17, he said, the people count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. Now, verse 18, so Saul said to Ahijah, so this is his uh, rent a priest, his ungodly priest, bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. So he's like, Oh, quick, we need our we need our ritual ark, we, this magic box that God has kind of given us. It helps us give the victory. And so he tells his wicked priest, go get that. We'll start doing that. 
even though the battle is already being won because Jonathan is trusting in God, God has given salvation. Now uh, Saul's trying to manipulate things. Um, I think it's just a sign of, of his wickedness instead of just saying, we can rely on the Lord. I'm going to follow my son who's repented and trust in the Lord, even though I haven't. He says, bring the ark here. Uh, verse 19, now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. So the battle is being won because they're relying on the Lord. Even though he's trying to do these ritual things, he starts to realize that uh, it's not these rituals that's granting us the victory. You don't even have to continue doing that. So withdraw your hand. It's God, perhaps, who is giving us the victory. Uh, just, I just want to point out this point. This is a little difficult here, but... Are you trusting in rules and rituals, uh, the appearance of religion, instead of in God himself? This is what Saul was starting to hope in again, a thing he's missed all along, that God is just his lucky rabbit's foot, a genie in a bottle. He doesn't actually love God, doesn't actually trust in God. We see this contrast because Jonathan didn't need the ark. Jonathan didn't need the ephod. Uh, he just trusted in God. And here you have Saul trying to trust in an effort and trust an ark apart from trusting in God. I hope your trust is in God. There's a person I've been witnessing to recently and it showed to them that I thought they were lost. Uh, they're a religious person and they not are listening at all because I'm telling them they need to repent and trust in Jesus for salvation for the first time ever. And all they hear is, yeah, I need to use those Jesus rules to try to clean up, to stop engaging in this sin or this habit. Um, and talking to him again this week, that's all they can hear. They think that you just use Jesus' rules and commands and morality to change your life. They don't even understand all those rules, all that morality, all trying to do these rituals to redeem you from the temptations that are, that are killing you won't do any good. This person, like Jonathan, unlike Saul, needs to turn and just trust Jesus, enter into a relationship with Jesus, a genuine, intimate one for the first time ever. They're missing the point, and they're missing the victory that could happen with, uh, as it does with Jonathan, who foreshadows Christ. Okay, last one. I told you I'm excited about this text, and if you're bearing with me, you're being kind, and maybe it's because God is gripping your heart with this passage. So last point of contrast. So let's review. The first set was about the son after or not after God's own heart. The second was uh, God using ungodly or godly counsel. The third here was trusting in God or just touch, trusting in God's rituals. And now I want you to see this, that God scatters and confounds his enemies and also gathers and unites his people. This happens in the last part of the text. It's really interesting here. I was telling you, this, the stuff this week was, was awesome. I felt like what the Lord was showing me. So as the victory continues, because... Uh, the people are starting to, more like Jonathan, trust in the Lord for deliverance. Look at what else happens in the battle. It's not just Jonathan verses 20, but the Philistines are all going to start panicking and going crazy. Look at uh, verse 20. Then Saul and all the people with him rallied and went into battle, and behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great confusion. So those enemies of the Lord, they start turning on themselves. They start killing themselves and just dying, the enemies of God, because God is the one granting salvation, not Jonathan even, or Saul, or these rituals. God is granting salvation. He is able to do that with your enemies. Things that wouldn't even make sense, but just you would stand and see the Lord's deliverance. Earlier in the text, there was even an earthquake, an earthquake that scared all of these enemies. And so I want to tell you that God is able, if he chooses, when we trust in him to confound our enemies, Satan's tactics, enemies in this world where government would cause trouble for Christians and take away freedom of speech, God is able to cause them to lose their mind or to have confusion and bills not to pass in, in Washington, D.C. Enemies of Christ in Alvatons community might be plotting to destroy our church. God is able to confound them and make their secret meetings uh, and, their, and their plans to, to fail. God is able to scatter and confound his enemies, even someone that I might be evangelizing at Western who might be mocking and making fun of the gospel at Hope House, he's able to turn their own words against them. We trust in him. So that's the scattering uh, and the confounding. And then the flip of that I get in verse 21. So he's scattering, confounding his enemies, but he's supernaturally uniting and gathering his people. 
Um, look at verse 21. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed after them in the battle. So you had the scattering of the enemies and the gathering of God's elect, his true people. It says that Jesus, preaching the gospel, will gather his elect from all four corners of the earth. So we learn here that in the recent times, some of the Israelites had defected and had went and had helped the Philistines, which is not good. They had backslidden, if you want to use that word, or defected, defected, and they start coming back. They, God's elect from them, start coming and joining him. This is probably part of the reason why there's confusion, because they had been wearing the the uniform and the armor of the Philistines, and all of a sudden, at God's deliverance, at the preaching of the gospel, they start coming out. And so then the Philistines are like, wait, are you with us? Are you not against us? And it looks like they're turning on themselves. God granting the victory. God is able to do that. The preaching of the gospel at Western's campus, those who are truly his will be drawn out. Uh, the preaching of the gospel in the church, those who are truly his will unify and come together. Even from Hollywood, that God would say from there or, or Washington, D.C. or from uh, enemy territory, he would bring in his people, unites them around Christ being lifted up of salvation in the Lord. Here's what I think of. Here's what I think of. I hope he's really a Christian. For right now, I'm willing to believe him. But Kanye West, who formerly is a very ungodly, God-hating, profa- uh, profane person in Hollywood and in the rap industry, has recently been saved and has changed his lyrics and changed some things about him. I'm not saying you need to follow Kanye, but I just think, like, what, 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 how does Hollywood respond to this? They're, they're confounded, but God's able to save from out of there and gather his people uh, at Bethany in Alton, in the community, when Christ is lifted up, when salvation in the Lord is what is put forward. And so I trust maybe even God is gathering you from the world right now, you from a backslidden state, to come and not fight against the local church, not to fight against what God is doing, but to fight with and to be unified with us as we follow Christ. So rich text, much, much more there. If you have any questions, personal message me, call, text, Uh, or explore and read these uh, words, um, asking God to help you. So, hope you all have a good night, and we'll see you again Sunday.